here, betting the house on tax cuts only makes sense when you consider this. Amongst a narrow group of voters, those who backed the Conservatives in 2019, those who attempted by reform, well, tax cuts are a lot more popular. So what does that tell us? It tells us this is the government trying to shore up their core vote, a party trying to limit their losses rather than a party trying to win. Well, let's take a look now, shall we, at that expected headline measure, a cut to national insurance by a further two pence in the pound and on top of the previous reduction the Chancellor made in the autumn statement. It means that 27 million working people will see a saving of an average of £450 a year. Fuel duty is also expected to remain frozen. A 5p a litre fuel duty reduction due to end at the end of this month will now be extended for another year. Will it shift the dial? Here's Sky's political editor, Beth Rigby, with tonight's first report. A Chancellor put in the final touches on his pre-election budget that could be his last. With so much at stake for Jeremy Hunt's party, as well as his own political prospects, a cut to national insurance come in our way. Miles behind in the polls, the Tories need a huge swing in support to get back into play. But voters in his constituency unsure if Mr Hunt can hold on. This seat is a key Lib Dem target. It's one of the blue wall seats, if you think. You think it's going to fall? It's a really good chance of, um, of getting Hunt out this time. Um, in the past, the old Guildford seat used to swing quite a bit and was close to a Lib Dem win on a couple of occasions. I think with the new Godalming and Ash sort of seat, we should be able to manage it. I think he's probably better than his party. Uh, I think he's a fairly straightforward MP. He's a good constituency MP. Uh, whether he'll be here after the election, who knows? Certainly, as a mum of three, I sort of get lost in knowing, you know, sometimes there are promises made and sometimes it's really hard to trust knowing that those, those promises are going to come, come to fruition. Members of Mr Hunt's local Conservative Association say the Chancellor needs to balance tax cuts with spending on public services. Infrastructure, it's childcare, it's education, it's the health service, and those are always the things that people will talk about. Yes, they would love tax cuts, uh, but everybody realises in their heart of hearts uh, that these have to be afforded. But news that Mr Hunt donated more than £100,000 of his own money to his local party suggests he knows the fight he's in to remain an MP. There are large numbers of candidates all over the country and they're showing their seriousness by putting their money in. We're going to fight a good campaign here and a strong campaign and we think that we should prevail. But a Liberal Democrat takeover is brewing here. Their leader, Ed Davey, on Hunt's patch. Cheers. And confident. I think Jeremy Hunt is in real trouble in his seat from the Liberal Democrats. Everyone can see that the Liberal Democrats are the ones who can win here in Ashton Godalming, but also across Surrey, across the blue wall. It's the Liberal Democrats who are the ones who can beat the Conservatives. The Chancellor will say that this budget proves his economic plan is on track and he will deliver another £10 billion of tax cuts for workers to prove that point. But whether he says he's delivering for voters or not, you don't appear to be listening. There were tax cuts earlier this year and yet the polls haven't moved. Indeed, some inside number 10 tell me quietly they don't expect this budget to be a big poll game changer. And that leaves the question, if this doesn't shift the dial, what next? Conservative MPs want the Chancellor to be bolder. So we've had national insurance cuts already. We had one in the autumn statement. That is why I think the best way forward would be to balance that out with an income tax right. cut. And obviously that's a change to the thresholds. Up to four million more people will be dragged into paying higher rates of taxation because those thresholds haven't changed by 2029. And I think we need to do something about that. <laughs> Amid all the war in Tory factions, there is consensus something needs to change. And if this budget can't do it, many will be asking what can. Well, we can talk now to Beth Rigby, our political editor, uh, who is here with us. So I guess we know one of the big mm. announcements already, don't we, then? It's quite unusual mm. uh, to know that uh, the expectation, anyway, is that the Chancellor will... Uh, cut two percentage points again off national insurance uh, on Wednesday tomorrow. That's about £10 billion uh, pounds worth of tax cuts. It will give 
people another £450 off. Uh, it's for working people, National Insurance, so it's about 27 million workers. An average worker gets 450 quid. You remember in January they implemented uh, this tax cut that he'd announced in November. It was the same thing. So that's £900 uh, in total for an average worker. How are they framing it? I think they'll do uh, the framing around this is about growing the economy, it's about work, it's about rewarding work. I think the framing of it that we'll see from the Chancellor is when you look into the future in April, energy bills will come down, uh, inflation target might hit 2%, the Bank of England's target in May, June. Does that have a knock-on for interest rates? And what you can see there, Sophie, is a government that is beginning to build a picture of stick with us, we're on track, uh, and this is the sort of down payment, if you like, uh, on tax cuts. I was told by someone uh, in government that this is more a proof point moment to prove to voters uh, that the government are doing what they said they would do rather than a big kind of big whiz moment, a big bold budget. That's interesting, not a big whiz moment, not a big bold budget and yet they brief out one of the big lines before. I mean if we're sitting right here, you know, tomorrow, same time, still talking about 2p off national insurance, is that going to be a problem? Well, look, I think there's a couple of things to say. Number one, a poll came out this week, and admittedly it's only one poll, but it had the Tories on their worst polling for 40 years mm. at 20 points. It's one poll. But that has really, really worried Conservatives. Someone said to me today, you know, looking at this, we are heading for a worse performance than 97. We could end up with 80 seats. That's the kind of doomsday scenario MPs... Uh, going for it. And the reason I said that, it's not, I'm not avoiding your question. I, I'm trying to say rather that if this is all there is, and the briefings are certainly like the fiscal headroom, which is how much effectively he has to play with, is limited, so there aren't going to be these big tax cuts. But if it is national insurance, you heard Priti Patel in that piece. She's speaking for dozens of MPs when she says that they want bolder tax cuts, they want national insurance cuts. She thinks that should come through cutting uh, public spending. Um, Look, Labour are saying to me tonight, they think that he will move on income tax. They think he has more headroom mm. than they're saying. We think it's about 13 billion. Labour think it's about 25 billion. I have to say, I've been strongly steered away from that. Mm. But this is a pre election budget, so you've got to expect a rabbit, haven't you? Yeah, I think so as well. I really think so. Find I think we'll get a soon. sense about whether or not it's an election sooner or later as well. Beth, thank you very much indeed. Beth Rigby there. Our political editor. Well, behind every budget, of course, is the economics. As important as the politics, more important, you might say. And our economics editor, Ed Conway, has been crunching the numbers and analysing that all-important headroom, whatever that is, the Chancellor needs to afford his tax cuts. It's the budget. And what does that mean? It means we're going to have lots of figures, lots of data. We're going to guide you through it all, though, including some important data. This is gross domestic product, the rate at which the economy is growing. These are the forecasts last time around. They'll probably have to be downgraded a little bit uh, in the short run because, why? Well, we're in recession right now, but they might be upgraded off into the future. I'm afraid that's not necessarily because the economy is doing brilliantly right now. It's because you've got really strong population growth, mainly because of immigration, which pushes those bars up. Another chart that's worth just focusing on, this is the tax burden, as some people call it. The amount of taxes we have as a percentage of GDP going all the way back many decades. And if you look at that line, that's the latest uh, projection, you can see it's getting up to the highest level since the aftermath of World War II. An extraordinary statistic there. And the Chancellor says he wants to bring the tax burden down, but he says he's hemmed in by headroom, by the amount of headroom he has. And it's worth just focusing on what is this headroom everyone's going on about? Well, it largely comes back down to the fact that the Chancellor's got three fiscal rules and the most binding of them is that he needs to get the national debt falling. This is their current projection for the national debt. And you can see it's not falling immediately. In fact, it's higher in a few years than it is at the start. But that's the key thing about the rule. The rule says you need to get it down falling uh, between year and four and year five. And is that happening? Well, zoom in. Yes, just about. Down from 93.2% of GDP to 92.8% of GDP. And the gap between those two things, that's fiscal headroom. But if you take that bar and kind of work out what that is in cash terms, that's about £13 billion. So when the Chancellor's saying I've got this fiscal headroom to play with, it's because of that. But a couple of things to note. First of all, take the £13 billion. By historical standards, that's not an enormous amount of headroom versus the kind of rules that different chancellors have had. So there, there's that £13 billion. 
Sunak, Hammond, Osborne and the coalition, they tended to have more room to play with against their fiscal rules. But secondly, and broader point here, why is there so much focus on essentially what are forecasts? We're basing a lot of government policy on these lines here. This is the OBR forecasts over the years of national debt. And you can see they, for they forecast change a lot. They change an awful lot because, of course, the future is unpredictable. And if you look at the gap between the forecasts and what's actually happened, so take this, for instance, that average gap, the five-year forecast horizon gap, going back the last few years, it's 415 billion pounds. It's a staggering, staggering amount. Raising the question, why are we basing so much decisions on investment, decisions on spending, decisions on tax, on all of this? One of those questions we may have answered, along with many others, in the budgets. Ed Conway there. Well, listening to that analysis is a Conservative peer, Lord Frost, who has been you're critical of the influence of the Office for Budget Responsibility, saying the Treasury under Jeremy Hunt has allowed the OBR to usurp its role. He's also been accused of being part of a secret plot to bring down Rishi Sunak after he was part publicising a £40,000 Hugo poll, which predicted disaster for the Conservatives at the next election. Great to have you uh, here on the here. eve of the budget. I'm very interested to hear uh, your analysis of where we are. So what do you want to see from the Chancellor tomorrow? Well, what I want to see is a budget that is, uh, deals with the problems the country has got. And it does have lots and lots of problems. There's no doubt about that. But what I'd like to hear is the Chancellor setting out a strategy, telling us that there's no future for this country as a high-tax, high-spend, social-democrat economy coming up with a strategy that's going to focus on growth. The economy is not growing, incomes per head are actually falling and people can feel it. We need something that deals with that and I'm afraid welcome as a 2p cut in national mm -hmm. insurance would be, it is really just sort of fiddling while Rome burns, I'm afraid. I mean, the Chancellor would say that's an expensive policy, it's a big policy, you know, two percentage points of national insurance. It helps. I'm always happy when the government stops taking money from people and allows them to keep it themselves. But it is only 0.5% of GDP. What we've got to do is set out a strategy. We've got to deal with the problems the country's got. We've got to try and get down energy prices, for example, deal with the net zero problem, deal with the productivity destroying public services that we've got. Deal All with of the those net zero are the big problems. problems. What does that mean? So we are we're spending we we've got a a net zero policy that I believe is pushing up costs of energy prices. Uh, energy is about four times as expensive here as it is in the US. If you want to see why our economy is not growing, that's one big reason for that. We've got to look at the strategy. It's no good just coming up with something to try and satisfy people on the day. We've got to show what is a Conservative strategy, how will Conservative Britain be different from Labour Britain, how are we going to get there? You tweeted uh, this week to say this, when will Conservatives start believing that the polls say what they say and that the party is heading for a massive defeat unless there is some radical change soon? I mean, you talk about a strategy, you talk about growth, but like, what's an example of the radical change that you think is necessary? Well, we need to get tax down, we need to get spending down. That's the, that is the biggest problem. The government's spending the uh, best part of a trillion pounds every year and good chunks of it are, are wasted. We need to do that, we need to deal with net zero. Zero. We need to deal with the NHS, which is wasting huge amounts of money. We need to get immigration down. We need to build more houses. There's, there's no end to the problems. A lot of people disagree with you, though, uh, on the tax and spend. You know, if you look at YouGov, for example, they recently asked people what they thought the government should prioritise. 57% said funding public services and only 27% said, said tax cuts. So are you, you know, there'll be people shouting at the TV saying, you know, you're the guy who, you know, went for Brexit. Now you're saying we should have tax cuts. Look at the state of public services. You're wrong. So people are right to identify that public services are not well funded. Undoubtedly, that is true. But the problem is not, is the problem is growth. We're not able to fund them because the economy is not growing. And we're not going to solve that problem by pushing up spending even further. We've got to get to grips with the fact that the country is living beyond its means in an economy that is not growing. And unless we take some difficult decisions to change that, we're just going to continue on the same path. Things are going to get worse and worse. You know, um, pollsters also do these kind of word clouds around politicians, where they ask members of the public, you know, what, what comes into your mind when I say this person's name? And I just wonder if I could do it with you. You know, what, what, comes in, what word comes into your mind when I say Rishi Sunak to you? Gosh, um, Prime Minister. 
Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Give us another one. An adjective. Uh, conventional. It, well, what we've seen is conventional economic policy over the last 18 months. And we've seen, as a result, the economy is not growing and Conservative poll ratings falling. And we've got to change that. Uh, now, I've got to ask you about the plot. OK? I've got to ask you about the plot. The non-existent plot. The non -exi OK, well, this, isn't, this is your chance to explain what, what's going on. Because you helped to organise it. I think you're right. Uh, I'm right in saying it. A £40,000 YouGov poll, which forecast a Labour landslide. The group behind the poll is known as the Conservative Britain Alliance. You know, it's a big, expensive poll. You then kind of framed it uh, in a particular way uh, in The Telegraph, a Conservative supporting mm. paper. What was the purpose of the poll? The purpose of the poll was to try and bring home to Conservatives, voters, MPs, everybody, that the polls said what they said, that uh, this was we were heading for a very, very bad election result and a lot of Conservative MPs were going to lose their seats. And although this particular poll has attracted a lot of attention, obviously, nevertheless, it isn't saying anything different from any other poll. In fact, it's more favourable to the Conservative Party than quite a few that have come since then. We've had three polls putting us at 20%. And I think um, it would be good if the leadership would worry less about the circumstances of the polls and a bit more about what they were saying, which is that we're heading for a very serious defeat. Who paid for it then? I, I, people are allowed to fund polls without having their names being, being made public. It's a free country and I intend to respect that. The important thing is that the message of the poll says what it says. I mean, number 10 weren't very happy with you, were they? Did they have some crosswords? There's, Some there's been, to chuck you out of the party. There's been, I, I, I don't think so, but there's, there's been the odds, there's been the odd sort of crossword, answer, uh, uh, undoubtedly, and I think that's a pity because what I want to do, and I think we all want to do, everybody who is involved in politics on the Conservative side wants to do, is get us to win an election. And the way of doing that is to deliver Conservative policies. You said earlier that this was a party focusing on its core vote. Well, I wish. Mm -hmm. We're well below our core mm -hmm. vote now. Mm -hmm. Most of our core vote won't come out and vote for us, mm -hmm. and that's the problem. Um, do you think that Rishi Sunak is the man to lead the Conservatives into the next election? Well, I, I don't want to get into that, actually. I've never called for Rishi mm. Sunak to be replaced as leader. I didn't in that article that you mm. referred to. I'm worried about the policies. I, I, I still believe it is possible to get the right policies in place and change the polling and put us on a better path. But we've got to do it very soon, I hope, tomorrow. And if you could wave your wand and have one budget policy in tomorrow's budget, which one would it be? Uh, something on net zero. I really think we've got to deal with that seriously, get energy prices down, get manufacturing and industry back in this country and start rebuilding the economy. Uh, really interesting to uh, hear from you. Thank you very much for coming on the programme today, Thank you. giving your thoughts ahead of the all-important budget tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Well, with a lot of talk in Westminster about possible cuts in public spending in tomorrow's budget to pay for cuts to personal taxation, I spoke to the man who wants to run the health service after the next election, the Shadow Health Secretary, West Treating. Thanks very much for being on the programme. So what do you want to see in the budget tomorrow? After 14 years of Conservative failure that's delivered the highest taxes in 70 years, public services not just on their knees but on their face, I don't think there are any gimmicks or rabbits out of the hat that Jeremy Hunt can produce to convince us or indeed the country that the Conservatives are capable of delivering the change the country needs, not least given so many of those problems were made in Downing Street by successive Conservative Prime Ministers and Chancellors. Uh, that's why, as far as we're concerned, a general election can't come soon enough. So instead of this phony war that we're currently all stuck in in Westminster, I think it's time for this unelected Prime Minister and unelected Chancellor to go to the country and ask for their permission to continue governing and to see who the public judge to be capable of offering the change Britain needs. OK, I know you won an election, but the question was about what you want to see in the budget. It feels like Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, is gearing up for tax cuts. That's what all the briefing is around. But the International Monetary Fund says now's not the time for tax cuts. They've advised the Chancellor against doing them. So what do you think is now the time for tax cuts? What we've argued consistently, that the tax burden on working people is too high. That's why Labour's... In terms of so the IMF in terms wrong, of in terms, of, in don't, terms you, of funding you don't our policies, think the IMF is right. well, no, look, you've got to look at taxation around. And in terms of funding the, in delivering the investment that a Labour government wants to provide, 
is things like abolishing the non-DOM tax status, ending the tax breaks enjoyed by private schools, a big windfall tax on the oil and gas giants enjoying record profits, closing the tax loopholes enjoyed by private equity fund managers, because we think those are fairer ways of making sure we deliver the two million more appointments we need to cut NHS waiting lists, mental health support in every primary and secondary school in the country, okay, doubling just, the number I'm just, I'm just of diagnostic scanners. But the, and, and Sophie, I think we're winning the battle of ideas here. I have every expectation that Jeremy Hunt will abolish the non-DOM tax status tomorrow in the mother of all U-turns, having ridiculed Labour for years for advocating uh, for this policy. I think he's going to do a smash and grab on some of our policies. That's fine. We're winning the battle of ideas. But in terms of the fundamentals of the economy, are the Conservatives getting it right? Absolutely not. And look at, look at the, just look at the numbers I in just, the economy at the moment and how I people just are wanna... feeling after... 14 years. I, ju I just want to come in because you know the IMF says now is not the time for tax cuts. We're expecting Jeremy Hunt to take 2p off national insurance. I'm just trying to work out where you are. You know, would, would Labour reverse that? Would you keep it? Is it good? Is it a good time to um, lower personal taxes? What do you think? Well, we'll judge the budget in the round. Rachel Reeves has been clear now for some time about Labour's industrial strategy, about the importance of getting growth back into the economy because if the economy had grown under this government just at the rate it did under the last Labour government, there would be £40 billion more a year to invest in our public services or to put back into people's pockets to help with the cost of living crisis. But that's 14 wasted years. We're looking to the future. We'll judge this budget in a round, but everyone knows this is a pre-election budget. And Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak will be keeping everything crossed tomorrow, hoping that the public will see the headlines from the budget and think, Ah, oh, well, let's forget about the last 14 years, guys. Let's forget about the fact that we're feeling the pain in our pockets. Let's forget the fact that we can't get a GP appointment, that we're waiting longer for an operation, that nothing is working better in this country than it was 14 years ago. And I don't think that's going to work. I want to talk about public spending. You know, it's public services, as you say. But I'm just trying to work out where you are on tax cuts, personal tax cuts now, because... That is what we're expecting from the government, 2p off national insurance, big personal tax cuts. Does Labour support that? Is that something you'd reverse? Well, we're going to have to judge the budget in the round. So We've won't argued say... consistently for cuts to people's personal taxation. That's been the ambition for Labour for some time, to bring the burden down on working people, because that's where the balance has gone wrong. And that's why I say, you know, we oppose the Conservatives when they hiked up national insurance previously, and we forced a U-turn before, I think we're winning the battle of ideas on this idea that personal taxation is too high. Where Labour has sought to raise money to fund vital investment in our public services, we've done it through fairer means of the Conservatives. Why is it that Rishi Sunak was so wedded to the non-DOM tax status for so long? Why is it that so many Conservatives have fallen over themselves to defend Labour's proposals to generate some income from the wealthiest individuals or corporations at the same time as those same Conservative MPs haven't blinked twice before clobbering working people with higher taxes. And I think people would be quite angry, actually, at this idea that having opposed abolishing the non-DOM tax status for so many years, when we could have delivered two million more appointments a year in the NHS, as Labour would do, the Conservatives, because there's an election coming round the corner, have thought, quit, lads, we better look busy and have something to say to the country. They haven't got any ideas. That's why they're raiding Labour's cupboards for ideas. It feels like it's quite... I, I get what you're saying. You're basically saying you think the personal tax burden is too high. You're not committing to reversing it. I feel like we can kind of read between the lines about what you think are on that. You go have asked people, though, what they thought the government should prioritise. 57% said public services. Just 27% said tax cuts. And I just wonder, you know, some people might feel that OK, you're trying to avoid a trap of Labour being seen to be, you know, putting up taxes and to be irresponsible with the public finances. But at the same time, are you actually falling into another trap that the Conservatives are actually leaving for you? Because it feels like these tax cuts are going to be funded by completely fantasy public spending figures for whoever wins the next election. And it feels like you might be falling into that trap by effectively accepting them. No, I think quite the opposite, actually. I think we've been winning the battle of ideas on how to generate wealth in our country and how to invest in public services responsibly. And people can More growth, very now. less trust. <laughs> um, growth is crucial. Um, and the fact that we haven't had strong enough growth in the last 14 years is why we've got this worst of all worlds where people have never been paying so much 
and public services have never been able to deliver so little. I think that is the tragedy of 14 years of Conservative failure, record high taxes and shocking performance from public services. And by the way, it's not the fault of the doctors, the nurses, the teachers and the frontline workers, the leaders of our public services. It's the, ultimately, it's the fault of the mismanagement of successive Conservative Prime Ministers and Chancellors. And look, this is the crux of the argument after 14 years. We've had every shade of Conservative opinion in number 10 as Prime Minister, every shade of Conservative opinion in the Treasury uh, as Chancellor. They've had their chance, they've had their time. I think it's time to go to the country now and ask them who is best placed to deliver the change our country needs after 14 years of Conservative failure. You talk, Clue, you talk it's a not bit, the arsonists, you talk it's a bit, the firefighters and the Labour Party. You talk a bit about the NHS there. The IFS is saying the NHS is facing the biggest real-term cuts since the 1970s. Would you give for the NHS more money? Well, look at where we've already set out our spending plans, you know, abolishing the non-DOM tax status so Come we on. can... Well, in... Would you give the NHS more money? Well, well, we've already made a point a on the non-DOM. Yes, I mean, yes is a short answer okay. because we've already made those commitments. And look, if the Conservatives do a smash and grab on the non-DOM policy tomorrow, we'll have to look at other alternatives because we are committed to delivering the appointments the NHS needs to cut waiting lists, to deliver the scanners and diagnostics so that people get diagnosed earlier and seen faster, to deliver the mental health support in every primary and secondary school in the country. Why? Because not only is that investment important, it's the reform that means if you get to people earlier, diagnose faster, treat more quickly, it's better for patients, it's also better value for taxpayers. Final question. One word answer. When's the election going to be? May the 2nd. OK. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Definite answer. We love that on the politics hub. Also pretty interesting to hear where streeting basically admit if the government does opt for Labour's non-DOMS policy, it could cause them a bit of a problem because they have to find money for the NHS elsewhere. OK, coming up next on the politics hub. Well, Westminster is pretty excited this evening as there is one more sleep until the budget. And after the break, we're going to hear from our guests, the chair of the Treasury Select Committee, Harriet Baldwin, and the former Labour Party Director of Policy, Andrew Fisher. And yet this budget could be a big one, not just in terms of the measures, but what it tells us about when the government might call the election. So we'll get reaction to that as well next. Today is all about the economy. The Chancellor could be a real game changer in the general election. It will be the pre-election fireworks. Big set piece event of Budget Day, of course. Whether it will be enough is the big question. Some may soon be promised a little more money in their pocket as we head towards the election. But will these budget giveaways be enough to gain your vote? Full coverage on Sky News. the road. There is a, a lot of gas being fired all around us. It is an absolute carnival kind of atmosphere out here for Prime Minister Modi's decisive victory. These students are defying the prohibitory order and now they're going to be arrested. We aim to be the best and most trusted place for news. The roads have been inundated. The only way out is to get people by boat. This on any given day would have been bustling with people, but today it's absolutely deserted. 
I'm Neville Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Hello, welcome back. Well, we've heard from Lord Frost and the Shadow House Secretary West Streeting before the break. Now we can go to our duo for this evening, the Conservative MP, Chair of the Treasury Select Committee, Harriet Baldwin, and the former Head of Policy to the Labour Party under Jeremy Corbyn, Andrew Fisher. Great to have you both uh, on the panel. Harriet, you've got a big job tomorrow as Chair of the Treasury Select <laughs> Committee. You're one of the first people to respond in Parliament to the budget. Yeah, it goes Chancellor, then it goes Leader of the Opposition, and then it comes straight to me. Mm. And so I don't have any advanced knowledge. I have to take very copious notes during uh, the budget speech, and then the very nice doorkeepers pass the budget documents down to me while the Leader of the Opposition is speaking, and then I have to get up and make my remarks. And you've got a bit of experience of responding to budgets as well, with Jeremy yeah. Corbyn as well, when he was yeah, so Leader Basically, of the, the Labour Party will have a, a kind of room just outside of Parliament where they're kind of got a team of people, which used to include me, you know, kind of going through it um, as you hear it, trying to rewrite bits of the speech necessarily if you need to, and then kind of quickly printing it out and sending a copy down to the chamber, which uh, has to arrive just in time before they need to get up and speak. So it's a tightly controlled thing, but it's, uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to do to react to it, especially if there are, as mm. we expect a few rabbits pulled out of the hat, because you've mm. got to respond to those things as well. So to be able to ad-lib and cut bits out of your speech is quite a... A task yeah. to do it last minute. <laughs> I hear you. So I, I mean, it's a different <laughs> scenario, but because we'll be here live yeah. waiting for it and having yeah. to, we'll come straight to us after he mm. sort of sits down or after yeah. you finish your bit. Yeah. But it's, it's quite good for me because I've got like Ed Conway and Beth Rigby <laughs> that I can just go to for their intelligent analysis. Yes. What do you think about this? Yeah. Yeah. And um, so what are you hoping to see tomorrow then? Well, we've seen one of the things I was predicting mm. would happen, which is that the 5p off the price of petrol mm. has been extended for another year. So that was something that. Uh, I'd been predicting for some time. Mm. Obviously, it was due to expire at the end of this month. So I was pretty sure going into an election when you're trying to keep inflation down, you're not going to add 5p to the price of fuel. Uh, I think that in, in terms of the context uh, for tomorrow, there's been um, some real progress. So inflation has fallen from, I think when Jeremy Hunt first became Chancellor, it was over 11%. Now it's down to 4% and it's on track to get to 2% later this year. So that's real progress. And you're seeing people's household incomes uh, rising faster than inflation now. But I think what he will want to do is do some of the um, measures in terms of tax reductions that really help households. And so uh, one of the things that was so interesting was that um, we had uh, 2p off the price of national, in, uh, the rate of national insurance. National insurance, of course, is very targeted at people who work and it adds an incentive uh, for people to work at additional hours. Real progress has been made. Do you agree with that? No, not really. I mean, look, we're in the longest li living standard squeeze in, on record. Um, we're in recession. Um, people are poorer now than they were in 2008 in real terms. Um, the OBR suggested in November that it would take till 2028 to get back to that level. So we're in a really bad state. You look at the state of our public services, they're collapsing around the country, whether it's the NHS, um, whether it's councils, whether it's the backlog in courts, pretty much everywhere you look is in real strife. Um, so, no, I don't think it works. And the national insurance cut, if that, if that is right, the 2p cut, gives £750 to somebody like Jeremy Hunt or an MP and £250 to a newly qualified nurse. So it's not a very well-targeted um, thing. When you look at the facts that we've got 600,000 more children in poverty since 2010, rising levels of infant mortality, more children in temporary accommodation, you know, you'd want to target that through universal credit, I think, rather than with a national insurance cut to target those most in need. But Labour That's... didn't vote against national insurance cut last uh, time, uh, so, well, um, you know, I'd be, I'd be very surprised if there were a cut in national insurance tomorrow that Labour would oppose it. Well, I don't think they're opposed it because they so can't just... amend it and say we would have done this instead. They can say that in their speech, but when it comes to a vote, they've either got to back it or oppose it. To so... be fair, West Streeting, it felt like he was effectively agreeing that, you know, personal taxes should calm down. It didn't sound to me like someone who was about to vote against it. 
Yeah, no, I, I don't I, think they will. I totally agree with that. And, and you know, don't let's forget the context here that we had the pandemic, which added 400 billion to the deficit. We had that terrible period where everyone was um, paying the uh, how much higher energy prices. That uh, the help for that added another. 90 billion to the deficit. So that's the context that we're in. And so that's why I would expect that uh, the national insurance cut uh, tomorrow, if we get one, um, will not offset the effect of some of these frozen thresholds altogether. We got a straight answer from West Reading. Mm. Uh, well, I asked him when he thought the date of the election was going to mm. be. So I'm going to put it to you guys as well. Yeah. Go on then, give us a date. When do you reckon the next election is going to be? Well, I think it could be on the 2nd of May, mm. and I think it could be as late as, let's say, November. So it's come sometime on, in that period. Come on, you've got to give us more well, I, well, I've been working on the assumption I'm not going to hold year, you to it. <laughs> no, that there was a, certainly a probability that it could be on the 2nd of May, um, and then, but it was more likely to be in the second half of the year, which is what the Prime Minister said. What do you reckon? I think it'll be October. I think the Conservatives, you know, tried the trick of cutting national insurance by 2p in November. Didn't work then. The polling's just as bad as it was back in November. They're going to do it again now. It won't improve the polling. They're not going to go to the polls when they're 20 points behind. And that's okay. where they are. We'll have to see. Thank you both very much uh, indeed. Lovely uh, discussion on the budget and the dilemma, I guess, uh, with the Chancellor and where he thinks uh, the spending cuts and where the tax rises should fall, or tax cuts, I should say. Right, as the news in the last few minutes, that Birmingham City Council has voted to approve £300 million in cuts and a 21 percentage rise in council tax over the next two years after the council effectively goes bust. A public services in crisis. We hear from the General Secretary of the Trade Union Congress. That's next.
Hello, welcome back. Well, in the last few moments, uh, Birmingham Council has voted to approve £300 million in cuts and a 21% rise in council tax over the next two years. The City Council, the largest local authority in Europe, had declared itself effectively bankrupt. It's trying to claw its way back to solvency. Well, the cuts will hit services from bin collections to social care, arts and libraries. There are also some issues specific to Birmingham Council, of course, as well, including the cost of equal pay compensation settlement that was set to cost the authority over a billion pounds, and that had serious implications for public services in Birmingham. We're joined now by the General Secretary of the Trades Union Congress, Paul uh, Novak. Thanks for being with you. This news just breaking uh, there at a time when the government's talking about cutting taxes, people in Birmingham are going to be paying an awful lot more. I think it shows the disconnect, doesn't it, between um, decisions taken around the Cabinet table and the lived experience of millions of people up and down uh, the country. And I think for the citizens of Birmingham, for the people who work for Birmingham City Council, real concerns. Concerns that are actually being replicated in councils right across the country, Labour councils, Conservative councils. This is what happens when you've had, cumulatively, tens of billion pounds worth of cuts to local council budgets. And it's not just local councils, it's our, uh, our NHS, our criminal justice system, environmental protections. It's hard to think of a single public service in this country that's better than it was 14 years ago. Normally I hate doing budget, pre-budget interviews because you don't know what's going to come in the budget, right? But we've actually got a pretty good idea. Yeah. We, we know it's going to be a tax cutting budget. We know that there's going to be this uh, 2p reduction uh, in national insurance. Is now a good time to cut taxes for working people? Well, listen, the reality is, in the midst of a cost of living crisis, any respite for working people is welcome. But I think the vast majority of the millions of people that we represent will say this is too little, too late, and it will do nothing to address the underlying pressures faced by families up and down the country. So I mean, you want more tax cuts? Well, well, no, no. What I want to see is action to grow the economy, to boost people's uh, incomes and to repair our public services. I mean, just look at wages in real terms, lower than they were now than they were in 2008. That's unprecedented in our economic history. The Chancellor's got no plan to boost wages, no plan to tackle the cost of living crisis, no plan to grow the economy, to repair our public services. Instead, I'm afraid what this is is a very cynical budget, a pre-election budget with no long-term plan to grow the UK economy. It feels like there is a very live debate about whether now is the right time to cut taxes. Obviously, we all would like to see taxes cut, but... We've seen, for example, the IMF saying that because of the public finances, the state of the public finances, it's not a good idea for the Chancellor to do it. So where do you fall on that question? Well, well as I say, I think we desperately need to rebuild and repair our public services, and I don't think, see how these measures will, will help in that way at all. I mean, there are other things the Chancellor could have done around tax. Uh, there is a £39 billion pound tax gap in this country between the tax owed and the tax collected. Now, you can't collect all of that, I think research by Tax Watch just published recently showed that you could collect £20 billion worth of that tax if you invested in HMRC. For every pound that you put into HMRC, the public gets back £15. The government is interested in that. What they're interested in is gimmicks uh, in the run-up uh, to a general election. I think the British public won't be taken by fools by what is a very cynical uh, pre-election gimmick. Um, we're looking increasingly at what Labour's doing because there is a likelihood, some might say, that by the end of the year it will be Keir Starmer in Downing Street, so more scrutiny of his plans. Yeah. How do you think Labour should respond to this? It feels to me like they're sticking pretty close to the government spending and tax commitments. Well, well listen, Labour are going to inherit an economic mess uh, uh, from, from this government and they're going to have to look at the budget uh, in the round. I've just heard uh, Wes on your programme saying that uh, if, if this effectively withdraws the additional support that Labour is going to put into the NHS, Labour will have to find money to repair the NHS from somewhere else and, indeed, mm. to repair and renew our public sector uh, services uh, more broadly. I don't think that anybody expects Labour to wave a magic wand and to fix 14 years of underinvestment in our public services, but we'd expect them to sit down with unions and workers to talk about how we solve the recruitment and retention crisis in our NHS, in education, and also to set out that long-term plan to repair our public services. As I say, not one single public service better now than it was 14 years ago. It's, it's a dreadful legacy that this government will leave behind if and when they're voted out at the next election. Um, West Reading was also talking about West Reading. He was pretty clear on when he thinks the election's going to be May the 2nd. What's your date, then? Well, I'd love it to be May the 2nd, because, frankly, an election can't come soon enough for the millions of people that we represent. This government has let down not the British public. Not quite the public. question, though. When do you think it's going to be? I, 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 I'm not a betting man, uh, <laughs> Sophie, so I'm going to sit on the Very fence. Very sensible. Yeah, but I just... I, I want an election to come, not for party political reasons, but, frankly, the, the country can't afford a single day more of this useless government.
There you go. Thank you very much, uh, indeed, Paul Novak there of the TUC. We're coming up next on the Politics Hub. 15 US states will hold primaries today, but the outcome of this year's Super Tuesday is set to be predictable, setting up a presidential contest between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Heard this one before, right? Rather than, were you up for Alaska, it's more of a case of, did you bother to stay up for Iowa? We're talking Super Tuesday, that's next. And coming up on the UK tonight at 8 o'clock, we'll be live in Cleethorpes for a special programme. Tonight, we are launching Target Towns, the constituency of Great Grimsby and Cleethorpes, which will follow throughout this election year. It's a key seat that both Labour and the Conservatives will be hoping to win. Tonight, we'll hear from a panel of people who live and work here about the most important issues to them. Find out what they want from Westminster. I think that when we're looking across history, that empires are a fundamental part of our history. Uh, they were the fundamental part of world order. And if we're thinking about this within the wider context, you know, King George III himself in the 1750s argued for uh, the abolition of slavery. He argued that it was immoral. We know that Queen Victoria, for example, was incredibly uh, kind to the Muslim community in the United Kingdom. And so ultimately, when we're looking throughout history, it's very difficult to actually make these specific arguments for who should be paying reparations. I'm half Moroccan. Should the Moroccan kingdom uh, be paying reparations to Cornish people for, for the Barbary slave trade? It's very difficult to actually pin down where these arguments should be lying and actually where this, these reparations or these apologies should, should be kept. King Charles, this is the man who is obviously head of state, head of the Church of England, and ultimately decided to commission the first monarch to commission a report into the royal family's links into the slave trade. So this is a man who was very much centred around equality, right? So this is a good thing. Um, in terms of who should pay it, that's ultimately your point. Well, it starts with King Charles, let's just be clear. Um, the monarchy advocated and benefited from the slave trade. We're talking 3.4 million people that were transported from the African continent into the Americas and the Caribbean, 450,000 of which died during the process. Monarchy advocated and benefited from that. We also have the fact that the slave owners were compensated, so people like you, people like me, paid as taxpayers for the slave owners' uh, a declaration or agreement that was sorted out 400 years ago in the past. King Charles is not personally responsible. Nobody today is personally responsible for the slave trade. And, and, I, and I hear your point, and I hear the fact that, you know, racism still exists today. And ma many, many of the institutional difficulties that we see today stem from these historical grievances. Yes, thank you. However, thank you. However, nobody today caused the slave trade. Yeah. Nobody alive today yeah. financially benefits from the slave trade today. And so I think it's incredibly, I, I think, uh, misingenuous to actually look at these arguments and actually say that we can trace back exactly who benefited, where benefited. But we can. Where, no, we cannot. We can. Hello and welcome back to The Politics Hub. Now, happy Super Tuesday. Yes, voters in more than a dozen states in the US are heading to the polls in what's the biggest day of the presidential primaries in this 2024 election cycle. Now, the nominees, well, we know who they're going to be, really, don't we? Uh, barring something literally incredible, Joe Biden is going to face Donald Trump this November in a rerun of the last presidential race. Both men are in their 80s. Both have their vulnerabilities. So today, on a huge day for US democracy, we thought we would remind you of some of the more news-grabbing moments, shall I say, from just the last few weeks of the two men, one of whom is going to be the next leader of the free world. Hello, folks. Taking away this freedom in America is Donald Trump. Putin, you know, has so little respect for Obama that he's starting to throw around the nuclear war terror. You heard that, nuclear. My memory is fine. Give me a cognitive test just so we can, you know, because you know what the standards were. And I aced it. All indications are this bill won't even move forward to the Senate floor. Why? 
a simple reason. Donald Trump. As a proud political dissident, I am a dissident. Crooked Joe. Crooked Joe. Crooked Joe Biden. Right, we can bring uh, back in our duo for tonight, Harriet Baldwin, the chair of the Treasury Select Committee, and also Andrew Fisher, former head of policy to the Labour Party. Before I do, though, I have got to issue an on-air correction. I said that both Joe Biden and Donald Trump were in their 80s. Donald Trump, of course, is 77. And I imagine he probably wouldn't be that happy uh, with me uh, if I got his... Uh, um, put a couple of too many years uh, on his age. Speaking as a 39-year-old, I know, you know, every year counts. <laughs> Twice your age, Sophie. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll take that, but yeah. still. <laughs> uh, right, serious chat now. What is going on in the States? I mean, we know what's going to happen, I guess, don't we? It's a, it's a rerun. Yeah, it is going to be a rerun. And, yeah, look, I think a lot of politicians in this country would be quite grateful to have 2.5% growth, pretty good record on job creation that Joe Biden's mm -hmm. got. Um, you know, a Green New Deal that he hasn't backed down from and you turned on and, you know, it's levered in lots of private investment that has created those jobs and that growth. So... Why um, isn't he storming it in the polls, then, if it's got that great well, record? Well, because uh, there are a number of reasons. I mean, one, I think the US is really polarised and it's hard to, and their electoral system kind of feeds into that as well. Um, but secondly, as well, there's a cost of living crisis in the US as well. Inflation has hit everywhere across the world because of uh, the post-pandemic kind of issues and... Um, the energy price issues that have been caused by Putin invading Ukraine. So they've been hit by that as well. But if you look at the overall picture, they're doing better than pretty much everywhere in Europe, certainly. And, um, you know, what we should say is whoever wins, the US is our closest ally, our mm. partner in NATO. You know, we meet that 2% target. And it's great to see the progress that's been made in NATO I'm on the Parliamentary Assembly for NATO. And we've seen... Uh, the number of countries that are ma making that 2% uh, target has gone up very, very dramatically. And I think, you know, we are in a very difficult situation here in Europe, the um, terrible invasion of Ukraine, and we need to show our strengths and we need to continue with that defence spending. Andrew um, was giving a, a staunch defence there of Joe Biden. I think I can probably guess your view on Donald Trump. Mm. What do you make of the two candidates? Or are you going to be too di diplomatic to say...? Well, uh, as I say, the you know, US is our closest as ally no, no matter what. Um, I would personally, if I were American, be on uh, Team Nikki Haley, just because mm. I would love to see a female mm. US president in my lifetime, just as I'd love to see a 50-50 parliament here in the UK in my lifetime. And it's International Women's Day this week. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, right, so we've been talking a bit about US politics. You mentioned there how polarised it is. Mm. Do you feel like our, po our politics generally is becoming more polarised? We see George Galloway, for example, entering Parliament this mm -hmm. week. Yeah, I mean, I think you've seen it with the Conservative Party as well. I mean, Lee Anderson, mm -hmm. um, last year when he was still Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party, saying the next election is going to be fought on culture wars and trans issues. I mean, as if anybody really thinks that's the biggest priority facing the country when the economy's in the state it's in, the NHS is, and all the other things going on. I mean, it does show that there's a, a wing of the Conservative Party, I wouldn't say the whole Conservative Party, to be fair, that clearly wants to take us down that kind of Trumpian, right-wing, culture wars kind of route that I think would be incredibly damaging because it, all it finds is scapegoats. It doesn't find solutions to any of the real problems we face. It finds somebody to point out and say it's all their fault. And that's a very dangerous and divisive route to go down. Um, and ho I hope British politics can resist that. I mean, it's up to the Conservative Party what it does. I'm the last person to advise them on what to do. <laughs> but, you know, I think... When we look at the state we're in as a country, people do want bold solutions. And the danger is if, if the mainstream so-called of politics doesn't offer that mm. and doesn't correct what's going on at the moment, then people will look in other places for that solution. Yeah, I think we're a very grounded democracy. You know, the fact that we're all constituency members of parliament, we've got our ears very close to the ground. We want to deliver for the people who send us to parliament. And I think um, there's often more in common, actually, in the chamber than there is that divides us. And I think one thing that's really united us is in making sure that this uh, election that we're about to go into, um, we do want to make sure it's really one um, where uh, those boundaries are respected, where people recognise that there are limits in terms of you know, you should be able to make political protests, but not intimidating or dangerous political protests. And also, you know, the advent of um, artificial intelligence and people, you know, coming up with avatars that say things that uh, go viral on the internet. That's the real challenge is, you know, you've got to, you've got to make sure that some of those viral things um, are really reinforced by the real life conversations on the ground. Mm. It does feel, though, doesn't it? I mean, it's a very noble aim to kind of try and have a kind of politer politics, mm. but... 
I'm bracing myself for the next year, <laughs> I'll be honest, uh, until the election. I, I feel like it's going to be a mm. pretty frenetic, mm. fiercely fought campaign mm. and that um, you know, can spill over into, into other areas, I mm. think. Yeah, I think that's definitely a risk. I mean, I remember in the last general election, there were a couple of times where Labour activists mm. were attacked on the street, had mm. ribs broken, a 70-year-old woman, you know. And mm. that sort of thing is very dangerous. I mean, very you shouldn't dangerous. Think of that. Obviously, there have been mm. threats to MPs. There have been mm. MPs killed, sadly, yeah. as well. Mm. But, you know, I think there is a, a kind of frustration with politics that is legitimate, by the way, that is reflected in what's going wrong in the country. And people are right to be angry about that. It's, make, it's making sure that politicians offer a solution to channel Direct it. that in the right way. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both very much uh, indeed. That is it from us tonight. But Yalda Hakim on The World is going to have lots more on Super Tuesday from 9pm. I will see you tomorrow from 11am for the Budget Programme. Is the UK tonight live this evening from Cleethorpes. Tonight we're launching our target towns, the constituency of Great Grimsby and